everyone. I'm Talar Shahinyan, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our third and final panel for today before the keynote address later on this evening. Um, our panel is called the Mukhitaris in the East, Trieste, Vienna, and Transylvania. Our first speaker is the curator of this weekend's rich program, Sebwa Slanyan. Who's, an, who's a professor of history and the holder of the Richard Hovhannisian Chair of Modern Armenian History here at UCLA. His talk is entitled The Great Schism of 1773, Venice and the Creation of the Armenian Community of Trieste. Thank you, Talara, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here. My talk today is, as Talar mentioned, the title The Great Schism of 1773, Venice and the Creation of the Armenian Community of Trieste. Uh, and without further delays, let's begin. In the 1901 bicentenary issue of the flagship journal of the congregation, Basmavem, Father Stepan Saryan makes the following obscure allusions allusions to events that shook the island in the second half of the 18th century and forever changed the course of its history. He writes, and I quote directly, thus dark clouds passed over the arches of San Lazaro and internal descent darkened for a while its luminous horizons. I express on San Subhazari Gamarin Vrayan, Seva Tuir Amber, Yev near Kindara Tani Tunel Al Jamanabmi, Havare Tsutin Anor Baitzad Horizona. This exceedingly cryptic and all too fleeting passage is, of course, a veiled reference to what can only be called the Great Schism of San Lazaro at a time when the congregation was cleaved into two rival and sometimes unfortunately bitterly opposed factions one in Trieste, followed by one in Vienna later on. Our, uh, Patriarch Malachia Ormanian is surely not alone when he says, in reference to the passage by uh, Father Sarian, uh, when he notes the certain cautiousness with which he glosses over complex disagreements and uh, um, misunderstandings that paved way for the division of the order. To the extent that we are familiar with the congregation's history, I think it is safe to say that most of us here, if not all of us, might know, most of us here would have a very vague kind of recollection or understanding of this so-called schism and the subsequent history it created. To the extent that we are familiar with its history, we might know that as with Father Saryan, indeed, that indeed certain disagreements and misunderstandings did take place on the island, therefore giving way to this separation of the order. If we have done our homework, we might even know that the Trieste order established in 1775. Uh, later on, sometime in the early 19th century, you might, we might know, relocated its base to neighboring uh, Vienna. But this is the extent of our knowledge, even for those of us who have read quite a bit. And the reason for this is because despite two centuries of uh, scholarship on the congregation's rich history, scholarship almost entirely written by Mahitaras amongst themselves, a miasma of silence has fallen over the islands, this turning point in the island's history. So my presentation today uh, seeks to accomplish three principal goals. The first goal is by relying on primary source documentation stored in the archives of Venice, Trieste, and Vienna to shed broad light on the general contours of this great schism. And maybe even to say a few things during the Q&A period about the reasons that gave rise to this schism. I say so fully, fully aware that the topic that I have undertaken perhaps uh, recklessly to uh, uh, address 
is a very sensitive one, and I proceed with due caution. My second point today, and one that is much more important and much more academic, is to shed light on the little known history of the tiny community of Armenians established in Trieste in the wake of the Mahitarist transmigration. And particularly to shed light on a 1775 edict issued by Empress Maria Theresa of Austria, bestowing upon the congregation unparalleled uh, privileges and rights. Uh, uh, an edict, like the community itself, that has largely, if not entirely, escaped the attention of scholars, including especially of scholars of the Mkhitaryan congregation. My third point is to very quickly, at the end, provide some context to the shift in the center of gravity of the Trieste order in 1810-1811 to neighboring Vienna. And I hope that having done these fulfilled these obligations that I've set out for myself and when the time is allotted to me, I hope that I will have set enough context for the excellent presentations, no doubt, that will follow mine and will address the Vienna and Transylvania orders. So without further delay, let's proceed uh, with, of course I forgot to, you can see my Trieste is, I don't have my laser pointer for some reason. Trieste is in the north northwestern armpit of the Adriatic Sea, the neighbor of Venice. So let me now uh, very quickly give you some quick over overview of the available documentation which allow us as historians to say something intelligent about the schism. <laughs> These sources are primary and secondary. The primary sources always, of course, much more important than the, the secondary sources are stored, as I mentioned earlier, in the Archivio di Stato of Venezia, the Archivio di Stato of Trieste, and the State Archive of Vienna. Of these, without a doubt, the most important sources are in the Archivio di Stato of Venezia, in a particular series of folders known as the Inquisitori di Stato folders. These are folders that connect, contain spy reports, uh, consular reports and other sorts of rumors that have been, that were collected by this body of Venetian, the Venetian government known as the Inquisitors of the State, Inquisitori di Stato. They have hardly been looked at and I assure you they contain graphic information on blow by blow level uh, about the great schism on the island just before and after and especially on the period of Trieste's first five years of history and so on. So. Uh, what are the secondary sources, one might wonder? The secondary sources are rather limited because of the silence, as I mentioned, but they are nonetheless quite excellent. They begin with this work up here, which is a work that I've been deeply, deeply indebted to for the last 20 years or so. It's a four-volume work written by Sarvis Theodorian, who left the congregation in 1860-something, after having written this work, which uh, has a detailed overview of the history of the Muradian, uh, Muradian and Murad, Collegio Murad Rafael as well, and that has in the fourth volume a uh, series of biographies of the eminent abbots of San Lazaro, especially of Abbot Stephanos Merconian, during whose reign the great schism occurred. And there he shed some light on some of the reasons. Uh, next in line is by far the most excellent work on the Great Schism, which is a work in Italian, an essay of 69 odd pages or so, written by the Italian historian Carlo Curiel, I believe a native of Trieste, but I'm not sure about this one, uh, published in the journal Archeografo Triestino, and entitled La Fondazione della Colonia Armena in Trieste. It's an exceedingly important work that relies extensively on the Inquisitore di Stato documents. Following this work by Curiel, the Armenian historian or Armenian writer, Hovannes Zavrian, not known to many of us here, published a detailed study, somewhat derivative of Curiel's excellent study, but with flecks of brilliance and insight of its own, and published in the unlikely place known as Heidenik Amsagir, the flagship journal of the AIF Tashnak in Boston in 1931 and 32, and this also contains detailed uh, history of the congregation. Last but not least, 
Uh, I forgot to mention an important primary source material, the work of the greatest womanizer and seducer of the 18th century, Giacomo Casanova, who wrote 12 volumes of, of his L'Histoire de ma vie, of which in the 12th volume he dedicated the 11th chapter entirely to the schism of San Lanzaro and how he was hired by the Venetian Senate and the Inquisitori di Stato to spy on the Trieste order and regularly write reports. His reports are in the Venetian archives. Wow. So, let's now move to the basic facts of the story. Uh, I will, most of the facts I'm telling you, I will tell you now, are actually in the publications I mentioned, so it's not as if we are looking for the first time at the dark side of the moon. This is well known to the extent that it has been studied. So, the facts of the story begin in 1749, in, on the 27th of April, when the illustrious founder of the Machitarist order, Abbot Machitar, suddenly passed away in old age, leaving a congregation essentially leaderless. At which point, Machitar's disciples had the difficult choice of nominating one among them as being the successor of Machitar. Before too long, the choice fell on a 33-year-old firebrand of a monk from Istanbul, originally Constantinople, by the name of Stepanos Melkonian. Melkonian assumed the, uh, uh, the throne of the abbot a year approximately after the demise of uh, Abbot Mukhitar, because he was in Bolis and he had to come back, and upon assuming the throne, began to pursue a number of policies that did not always sit well with some of his brethren. There were two issues in particular in Stepanos Melkonian's character that created the conditions, ripened the conditions for a kind of schism. And these were, first, his, the authoritarian streak in his personality, one that, as a historian I can say, was probably very much in need of at the time. Uh, and second was his handling of finances, which did not always take into consideration the needs of his followers, at least from the point of view of his followers. So these two trends of his character led to a clash which came to a head, interestingly enough, in the period immediately, immediately after 1764, when the congregation received an unexpected endowment from two brothers who were members of, who were members of scions of the most well-known and richest Armenian Catholic family, the Sharimanyan family, originally of Jufa, but with branches all over the world, including St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, Moscow, Calcutta, Bengal, uh, Madras, and so on. Two of these brothers, Zakaria and Bahram Sharimanyan, passed away unexpectedly in 1763 and 1764, 1763 and 1764 in Calcutta. These are their tombstones in the Calcutta Catholic Church, and then left their wills bequeathing their entire fortune of 100,000 pesos de ocho, piastres, Spanish currency, silver, to the congregation, for the congregation to use for various uh, ends, including especially publication of books, of which the most famous, of course, is Mikhail Chamchan's Hayat Spaventure. But many other things were published with their money and so on, and apparently this money, according to Abbot Melconian's detractors, was used in a somewhat not so recent fashion by being loaned at 4% of an interest at 4% interest rate to this very well-known prince of an Armenian merchant in Venice, a man by the name of Giovanni Serposian, Giovanni Di Serpos, who was a Marchese or a Marquis, and who had close ties, personal ties, with Stepanos Melkonian. The story I'm very relating to you now is mostly from Casanova's memoirs and also archival documents. His tombstone is in the Santa Croce Church in Venice. So, uh, before too long, I don't want to give away the next slide, before too long, after the use of, this, of these funds in, seven, seven, in the 17, late 1760s and particularly around 1772, a group of 10 out of 19 monks, a clear, a clear majority, asked Stepanos Melkonian to have a general conclave, a meeting, at which point they compelled the abbot to give a full accounting of his decisions and to pass it to a, through a popular vote. 
when Melkonian being someone who did not brook any dissent, decided to dis dismiss these uh, invitations, the monks took the extreme measure of overthrowing him and essentially opening a door to an unprecedented event in the island's history, which involved the invasion of the island by a small contingent of Venetian troops accompanied by this members of this very shadowy body of the Venetian government, a body known as the Inquisitori di Stato, which had been founded in 1539 by the Venetian Senate and preceded the famous Inquisition of Spain, and whose only task was to collect information through a vast network of confidenti or moles or spies spread out throughout Venice and outside of Venice as well. Any rumor, any document, any information that could harm the future of the Venetian Republic was collected by the confidenti of the Inquisitori and delivered to the three magistrates of this secretive body which, whose influence grew in disproportion, grew disproportionately to the weakness of the Venetian Republic. So by the 1770s, the Inquisitori had uh, informants everywhere and nothing would escape their ears, including, of course, actions that were taking place by Armenian priests in the Venetian lagoon of San Lazaro, in the island of San Lazaro. So before too long, in May, May the 16th, 1773, the Inquisitori's henchmen, their footmen, uh, by the name of Cristoforo Cristofali, came to the island with forces and accompanied by the Venetian Patriarch, the Patriarch of Venice, who was responsible to the Pope and under whose jurisdiction the island fell. They arrived on the island, somewhat like the Byron painting that I showed that is on the uh, program, and immediately released Melkonian from essentially house arrest, and they placed him back in power and arrested the 10 uh, 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 impost martabets. In other words, the 10 rebellious monks were arrested. They were compelled to uh, uh, apologize and to repent and to fix their ways, and soon of course, eight of the ten caved in and repented and were accepted with open arms by Melkonia. The two ringleaders uh, that included this distinguished gentleman here, Deodato Babik, whose name has been brought up earlier, Asfadadur Babikian, originally from New Jufa, and his assistant in all these things, a senior to him, uh, a man by the name of Minas Gasparian of Arvin, the two ringleaders refused to repent. And so for them, a special punishment was in store. They were accompanied by the inquisitors, uh, footmen, Cristoforo Cristofali, and uh, particularly Deodato Babikian, the more uh, unfriendly of the two, was accompanied by the Venetian inquisitor straight to the uh, city of Trieste, the uh, neighboring Adriatic port city, and left there for a lifetime banishment, uh, not ever returning to Venice. <coughs> Minas Gasparian, on the other hand, was taken to Trento, where he, he too was uh, exiled for life. And of course, to add a little icing on the cake, the inquisitors, uh, the inquisition, decided before exiling these two monks of excommunicating them from the Catholic Church. So the Venetian patriarch, the patriarch of Venezia, I forget his name, Bragandina, I think I could be wrong, personally excommunicated these two monks, thinking that once excommunicated, they would not have any means open to them to make a, to have a livelihood. The two were sent to Trieste, but uh, much, to the, much to the dismay and shock of the Venetian authorities, their arrival in Trieste was met with incredible success. So much so, in fact, that despite their excommunication, the monks were welcomed openly, were given all these privileges, and soon began to threaten the very prestige of Venice as a cosmopolitan port city. And so to understand this reception that they received, one has to look back very quickly at the importance of Trieste as a port city. Trieste was established in, uh, well, Trieste had been under the rule of the uh, Habsburg dynasty, famous dynasty for being Holy Roman emperors. Uh, from the period of 1382 onwards. 
until 1700s, Trieste was a sleepy fisherman's village. It had 5,000 residents. It was a backwater place. But when Charles VI, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI, came to power, he vigorously pursued policies that we will understand today as being modernizing policies. He made Trieste a free port, tax-free, to attract merchants, granting them toleration, and so on. And soon, Trieste's population uh, quintupled, if that is the right term, from 5,000 to 25,000 by the end of the century. And Trieste began to rival Venice, consciously rivaling Venice, Venice for, its, for a place in the sun as a free port with attractive merchants. Uh, who were settled there. Uh, by the 1750s, several hundred Sephardic Jews had already congregated in Trieste. They had a very, very important community, the largest minority community, followed by Greeks, Serbs, and others. Because uh, the government of Trieste under the Habsburgs allowed these people large, large uh, uh, degrees of tolerance. So, no Armenians lived in Trieste until 1769 when uh, the Armenian priest Giovanni Ariman was hired by the Trieste government, free of charge, paid by them, to attract Armenian merchants. And it was in this context that Minas Gasparian and Diodato Babi arrived in Trieste. Before too long, they were given these privileges. And I want to now very quickly, because my time is running out, very quickly go over the uh, Empress Maria Theresa's edict, edict that was issued to them in 1775. There are three copies of this edict. One in Vienna, one in Trieste, and probably one uh, somewhere else, I would assume. But the Vienna one is the most complete one. And the Trieste edict is important because out of the 53 articles to the Makitaris Congregation and the Armenian nation of Trieste, most concern the printing press of the island. The island wanted to have a printing press. Uh, that was one of, the one of the objectives that the monks sent before they split. And uh, the articles granted them the right to print Armenian books for 20 years, a monopoly like the Antonio Bortori monopoly and so on. So in effect, giving the Trieste Mokitaris a printing press of their own before their brethren in San Lazaro, which was in 1789. They had a press in 1785. In addition to that, the, article, the edict gave the nation of Armenians vast degrees of la uh, latitude and tolerance to have, uh, uh, to elect a governor of their own, a secular governor and so on. And, uh, Unfortunately, it was uh, a dismal failure for the Trieste government because contrary to great expectations, only 35 to 40 Armenians arrived in Trieste. And yet, like many other Armenian colonies, despite the few numbers, they had a church, they had a street named after them, and they projected an image of prestige far greater than their numbers. Uh, for the Trieste faction, the edict was extremely useful because it allowed them to publish path-breaking books, mostly in armeno turkish but also secular books, including Viva Samantun Amerigo, uh, commissioned by Deodato Babik's brother, Hovannes uh, Rafael Babikian, as well as books written by merchants such as Marka Rashadimanian. All these were did, uh, published with the intent, intent and purpose of raising money for the fledgling congregation. But unfortunately, not enough money was raised. There was a school that they had, which was another dream of theirs. That also did not meet with uh, success. Therefore, leaving the congregation, no choice but to send a representative to India to raise money, which resulted in the Murat, Collegio Murat Rafael money, which I've written about extensively, but also a representative to Istanbul, a man by the name of, if I remember correctly, I, don't, I didn't write it down, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, one of the representatives went to Istanbul to raise money. He took out huge loans from Armenian merchants on bills of exchange that were not honored or paid back. And so in 1809, the Mahitaras Foundation and Trieste fell to Napoleon's reign. Uh, the debtors, the creditors of the congregation in Bolis had the right to sue them in the courts. Uh, so the, they were forced to take refuge in uh, Vienna, where they were given the full protection of the Habsburg court once again. And they thrived and, of course, to this day subsided. The problem with the two factions, as the eminent archbishop noted in his speech, were reunited in 2000, I believe the summer of 2000 or 2001. They were brought back together and they now are one congregation. So I hope this lays some groundwork for the other presentations to occur and I'm happy to answer questions later on. Thank you.